Ok, ok. Ciao everybody, ciao Neil. I'm super honored and happy to introduce you today to the Festival of uh, Scienze e Innovazione di Settimo. The first time I hear about you, it was in Settimo, uh, this winter in a talk uh, for classes. And a boy asked me, have you ever seen or heard it about your antenna man? Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was so strange, but now I discover it was true. And um, I'm Madeleine Frochot, I'm an uh, illustrator and digital artist. I'm based in Turin. And in 2009, I founded the Imperfect Studio because uh, our uh, philosophy, and we really trust in the beauty of imperfection. We think that is in the imperfection we have the scene, seeds and the starting point for something to evolve out of the mainstream. And um, I think uh, you are <laughs> one of the extraordinary things that can happen when you have an artist with a starting point with an imperfection. So um, Neil will talk um, about his uh, performing art and is a cyborg uh, being. And um, I want to start with uh, a Paul Klee, um, uh, fr super known phrases that is, uh, uh, art does not represent, but make visible. And we have now a new form of art and human being that can uh, uh, make visible the sound of the colors. So I don't spoiler <laughs> all your talk. And uh, this is Neil Arbison, and uh, it's your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I was born with an unusual visual condition called achromatism which basically means I don't see color. So as a child, when I was told that I couldn't see colors, I tried to ignore color. But soon I realized that it was impossible to ignore color. Because even if you don't see color, you can't ignore that it exists because people like you keep mentioning color every single day in daily elements that usually have nothing to do with the beauty of color, but they're daily elements that contain color words like red cross, green peace, pink panther, yellow submarine, Bluetooth, blue cheese, uh, yellow pages, blue tag, pink flight, James Brown, it's in his last name, Greenland. So every single day I was aware that color exists. Also, when color is used as a code, it can be confusing. Hot water and cold water sometimes is only expressed through color codes. So I always have to try both uh, taps to see which one is which. Also, maps use a lot of color codes. This one is fine if I go to Lisbon. But if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost because some maps really depend on color perception. Also, when I was at school uh, and I tried to learn the colors of flags, I had this situation. So France, Ireland and Italy share exactly the same flag. Also in daily conversations, like the sentence, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea if I've seen this person because the only information I have is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. So this was the moment I realized that I had to find a way of sensing color because ignoring it was not possible. And then when I started studying more about color, I became very interested in Isaac Newton's theory he thought that color and sound were related. In the 1600s, he created this scale relating each color of the rainbow to a musical note. So I thought this was a great way of starting to find a way to sense color. 
but Isaac Newton had no way of realizing if this was true or not. Back then, he had no technology to know if there was really a relationship between color and sound. But now technology allows us to know that colors have frequencies, frequencies of light, and sound has a frequency, an audible frequency. So both color and sound have something in common. They both have frequencies. They both vibrate in a way. So 20 years ago, I decided to create a project so that we would be able to hear the vibrations of color. In 2003, so it was in October, actually, 2003, so 20 years ago, I started this project and we created this system at the beginning. It was a webcam connected to a five kilo computer with a software that slowed down the frequencies of color until they become audible. So I started using headphones and I started walking around hearing the sounds of color and I started memorizing the sound of each color. So for example, now you are hearing the vibrations of red going to orange. And then it keeps going up. So I memorized the sound of each color and the names that you give to each color until I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum through sound from red to violet. But then I didn't see why I should stop there. There's many more colors that exist that humans can't see, like infrareds and ultraviolets, colors that snakes can sense or that can, bees can also sense. So I decided to include these colors in the system and suddenly I was able to sense more colors than you. I was able to go out in the street and tell if it was a good day or a bad day to sunbathe, because if I sense high levels of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun. And then infrared perception suddenly allowed me to know if movement detectors are on or off in a shop or in a bank. So I can easily tell if alarms are on or off in banks or shops. And it's interesting to see that many of these sensors are actually fake and they don't actually work. <laughs> now the system 20 years ago wasn't very comfortable. It was big and it wasn't really an organ. It was a wearable. I didn't want to wear a sense and I didn't want to use technology to have a sense. I wanted to have a sense. So I thought that the best way would be to create an organ, a new organ that would be implanted in my body. I looked at nature and I saw there's many organs that we don't have. We don't have wings, we don't have tails, we don't have horns, we don't have antennas. But I thought that maybe an antenna to sense color would be the best option. So I designed this antenna with a smaller chip that transforms color into vibrations. And then I tried to find a doctor willing to implant the antenna in my head. But when I went to the doctor, the doctor said, sorry, we don't do antenna implants here. If you want to have it implanted first, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee. So I presented the surgery to a bioethical committee. And in the end, they said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted in my head for three reasons. One, because it's not a pre-existing body part. If it was a leg or an arm, it would be ethical. But they said antennas are not human, so this is not ethical to have a new organ. The second reason, because it's not a pre-existing sense. Hearing color is not human, and also sensing infrareds and ultraviolets is not human, so they didn't find it ethical either. And the third reason is that they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out from the head. So they said no, but I found a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously. So we did the surgery. Uh, this is my head facing down. My hair was removed in this zone. Then the skin was reduced and then my head was drilled four times. So I have four different implants. One implant is this small chip that vibrates depending on the dominant color in front of me. So if there's the vibration of blue in front of me, blue enters in the antenna, goes to the back of my head, it vibrates, and then I feel the vibration of blue in my head, and I can also then hear this vibration in my inner ear. 
The two other implants are to hold the structure of the antenna. And the fourth implant was added later, which is internet connection. So I can also receive colors that are not in front of me. So this is basically now a new organ that is part of my body. It's actually part of my skeleton. So I can say that now I'm also officially taller because this antenna also makes me slightly taller. I had to get used to the new height. I also had to get used to the new electronic sounds in my head. And I slowly got used to the new sense until the point I was even dreaming in color and also dreaming that other people had antennas. Internet connection has allowed me to receive colors that are not in front of me. Five people in the world have had an app that allowed them to send colors to my head. So this is the way of using the internet as a sense. Instead of using the internet as a communication system or a tool, we can also start using the internet as a sensory extension or as a sense itself. So I'm now here in Italy, but suddenly I could be sensing the colors of a sunset in Australia. So friends can share their sense of color by using the internet as a sensory extension. Also, if they send colors when I'm sleeping, they can color my dreams. So if I'm sleeping and someone sends yellow colors, lemons might appear in my dream or they might just wake me up. So this sonochromatic sense, having the internet connection allows me also to connect to NASA's International Space Station. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer here on Earth, but in space. So I see this as becoming a sense thrown out, basically having senses in space that allow us to explore space without having to go physically to space. The risk of having internet in the body, the main risk is that you can be physically hacked. Through all these years, it only happened once that someone without permission started sending colors to my head. So I was physically hacked once, but I enjoyed it. It was an interesting experience to find out that someone was able to hack my body. But in order to stop this, I decided to stop using the internet and I decided to start using the blockchain. So now, in order to send colors to my head, you need to do it via an NFT. This is the safest way, the safest way of connecting my body to the internet right now. And I think that in the future, if more people have internet in their bodies, using the blockchain will be the safest way of doing it. This NFT now has an unlockable content. So the owner of the NFT can unlock the content and then this person can send colors to my head. I see all this as cyborg art, the art of creating new senses, creating new organs and designing our own perception of reality. The word cyborg comes from two words cybernetic organism, and it was created by this man, Manfred Kleins. Uh, he thought we needed a word to define people whose brain has been modified by electronics. Because when he created the word, the word bionic already existed. A bionic person is someone whose body has been modified by electronics. A mechatronic person is someone whose body has been modified by mechanical parts, whereas a cyborg is someone whose body and mind has been modified by electronics. So I feel that cyborg defines because both my body and my brain has been modified by technology. I think we need a new word as well, psychological cyborgs, which I think is most of you. Uh, is someone whose mind has been modified by electronics. You notice this in language. Um, if you say, I'm running out of battery, instead of saying, my mobile phone is running out of battery, you are already unconsciously talking about technology in first person, and it's a clear sign that you are already including technology as part of you. So maybe most of you already are merged psychologically with technology, and maybe you are not so far away from merging biologically as well. 
this is an MRI scan of my brain. I no longer feel the difference between the software and my brain. So that's why I define myself as cyborg and also why I feel that I'm not using or wearing technology. I feel that I am technology now. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004. I had to renew my UK passport and my photo was rejected. They said that electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. I replied saying that the antenna is not an electronic equipment, but a new body part. And I told them that I define myself as a cyborg. They replied saying, uh, no, please just remove the antenna from the picture. So it became a discussion, a, a battle with the UK passport office, trying to convince them that they should accept me as a cyborg. After some months, they finally accepted the explanations I gave and they allowed me to appear in the passport with the antenna. And this has helped me ever since to travel around the world because airport security controls are very strict sometimes. So it's quite um, challenging to go through passport security controls without uh, documentation like this. I am also in conversations with the Swedish government because the material that I used to create the antenna is Swedish. So I'm telling them that I am Swedish because part of my body is Swedish. So I think I should also be entitled to become a Swedish citizen. Now, in order to become Swedish, you need to live in Sweden for at least five years. But I'm telling them that Sweden has been living in my head for more than five years. So I think that I should also be allowed to become Swedish. They still haven't replied, but hopefully they will. I was there just a few weeks ago. So hearing color has changed many things. Like now I can dress maybe in a way that doesn't look good, but it sounds good. So I can decide if I want to dress in C major or in F minor, or I can actually wear a song. I can design clothes that sounds like specific melodies and present them in, in fashion weeks, for example, where models wear specific songs. I can also now paint a house so that it sounds good. If the living room is blue, yellow, and pink, it sounds C major. If the floor is red, it sounds profound. It has a profound sound to the whole house. If the ceilings are black and white, they are silent. And I like kitchens to be violet because violet is a high frequency. So it keeps you alert. And it's also a color that we don't usually eat. Now I can compose music by looking at things, especially fruit and vegetable. I used to play the piano, but now I can play music simply by moving my head and looking at different colored objects. Milk is silent. Um, so walking around supermarkets is a completely new experience because I can hear many melodies in supermarkets now. It's like going to a nightclub. It's like hearing music uh, that is unexpected in every aisle. I really enjoy cleaning products because uh, they have unusual and very vibrant colors. Art galleries have also become a musical experience. I can now listen to Picasso. I can listen to Salvador Dali. All painters have become composers. And it's uh, easy to distinguish a painter from another by just listening to their paintings. Also, I can paint what I hear because each note in music relates to a color. So I really enjoy painting music. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night from the first note to the last in the end. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber. Also, it looks quite different because they used very different um, notes. I'm not Speeches surprised can also be transposed to color because we use different frequencies when we talk. Our voice talk. has usually How a dominant color. Of the new so I can also do color the speeches. The also, food has a lot of color. So I really enjoy this playing the food on the plate in a way that it sounds like a melody. So I can then literally eat a song. In order to share this experience of eating songs, I decided to collaborate with a chef in Girona. It's Celleda Can Roca. So this chef uh, 
collaborated with me in the creation of this dish, as you see in this, uh, it's, a, it's a plate that has a chip inside, uh, and the chip detects the color of the food on the plate, and it has a loudspeaker so that when you rotate the plate, you can hear the sound of the color of the food. So you can literally go to this restaurant and ask for a specific melody, and it will be served on your plate, so then you can eat um, a Lady Gaga melody or any song that you want. So the chef becomes a composer, and this is um, basically how it works. We call it sonochromatic gastronomy, and it's uh, challenging because uh, the chef needs to be a composer or a musician in a way as well. So it's adding a new layer of perception in food. People also have lots of color. So when I look at someone's face, I hear the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, the hair. And I really like creating sound portraits where I write down these notes and then I create an MP3 so they can listen to their face. We all sound different. Uh, one of the first sound portraits I did was of King Charles III. I asked him if I could listen to his face and this was his reaction when I asked him. He actually sounds quite good. He sounds C major. He has a, a color combination that sounds like a major chord. And everyone sounds different. Um, Judy Dench has silent hair, for example. Steve Wozniak has a pure uh, A note in his eyes. Robert De Niro has a melody in his lips because he has different shades of red. Marina Bramovic has a, a rhythmic face because her colors are very close to each other, so they create friction and they create a rhythm. Bono has very loud glasses because they're uh, saturated and high frequency glasses. Philip Glass sounds very microtonal. But what really shocked me is that humans are not black and white. Um, people who say they are white, they're not actually white. And people who say they are black, they're not actually black. People who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. And people who say they're black, they're very, very dark orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. <laughs> Thank you. This is an example of a sound portrait. So basically what I just said is just an example of how a life can be changed by adding a new sense. New senses will create new cultures. As I showed, this is just the consequence of one very simple sense, hearing color and perceiving ultraviolets and infrareds. Imagine if you all had new senses. It would create all types of new cultures and new um, sensations in our society. There are many senses and organs that we don't have and that we could have, senses that other species have, and it's already happening. Other people are creating their own senses and merging with technology. For example, elephants can sense infrasound and they, this allows them to feel earthquakes before they actually happen. So Moon Rivas has two implants in her feet that allow her to feel seismic activity from one in the Richter scale. So her feet are connected to online seismographs and where, whenever there's any movement uh, in the world, she feels the vibration in her feet. She calls it the seismic sense. And she says it's like having a second heartbeat. She has her own heartbeat, and then she has the earth beat in her feet. There are earthquakes very, very often. So she, it, it is like a, a second heartbeat. She also has internet connections, so she can also feel moonquakes. There is a seismograph on the moon, uh, so she can also uh, extend her senses to space. So she's also a sensetronaut. We also did a project in Brazil inspired by bone communication that elephants have. Elephants communicate by tapping on the floor 
and through the infrasounds that can communicate in long distances. We created this tooth that was installed in my mouth. Another tooth was installed in Moon's mouth. And whenever I clicked, she received a vibration in her mouth. Whenever she clicked, I received the vibration in my mouth. We both learned the Morse code, so we were able to communicate from mouth to mouth by clicking. It was a slow communication system, but it worked, and it would work in space, because it's a communication that doesn't need air conduction, and it would also work under the water. It, we called it the transdental communication system, and it's very simple because it works through Bluetooth. So it's a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate from mouth to mouth. Some animals have this ability of sensing presence around them without using traditional senses. It's echolocation. Joe Dagny has two implants in his cheekbones and at the back to sense presence around him. So if someone gets close to him, his head vibrates and he can choose the distance that he wants to feel. So this is a form of echolocation in his head. Some animals have magnetoception. They can sense if something is magnetic. So we created hair implant that allows you to feel if something is magnetic. If you get close to something that is magnetic, your hair will get stuck to it. Bioluminescence is an ability that some species have, uh, creating light. So we created a tooth that when you click, you have emergency light in your mouth. Uh, I had it for a while, but I had it removed because when I was eating, the light was going on and off all the time. So it was disturbing for others. So we're trying to find a way that it will work without the click. Sensing north or geomagnetism is something that many birds can do. They can feel the north. So we created small compasses that can be implanted at the back of your knee. And then when you face north, you feel a small, small push in your, in your knee. So this gives you a sense of direction and orientation that we don't have. Uh, we know where the north is if we look at the sun or if we look at some uh, references, but we don't actually feel the north. And this implant allows you to feel the north. Weather stations can sense the weather in a very precise way. Manel de Aguas was interested in sensing the weather, so he has two implants at the side of his head that allow him to sense temperature, humidity, and atmospheric pressure in a very precise way. We didn't find anyone in Europe willing to implant these fins in his head, so we went to Japan, and then the first uh, surgery process was done there in Tokyo. Radars exist outside in the street to sense speed, so we created earrings that allow you to also sense speed. It's a pair of earrings with infrared and um, a small vibrator, and then when someone moves in front of you, it activates a vibration in both ears. Depending on the interval, you can slowly gain the sense of speed. If you turn them around, then you can suddenly sense if someone is behind you. It gives you retroception. It's a sense that cars have. We could also have this sense by adding these simple earrings. And the latest sense that I'm creating is an organ for the sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ specifically designed for the sense of time. So it's a crown that has a point of heat that takes 24 hours to go around the head. So basically, if you feel the point of heat here, it means it's 12 o'clock solar time in London. If you then feel the heat on the right ear, it means the sun is starting to shine in New York. So you basically feel where the sun is shining and it gives you a 24 hour cycle that allows you to sense the passage of time. Now the aim is not to know what time it is. The aim is that the brain will get used to the 24 hour cycle and whenever this happens, I want to see if we, can, if we can create time illusions. By changing the speed of the point of heat, you should feel that time is stretching. Or if you make it go faster, you should feel that time is going faster. So the aim is to take Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice 
and see whether or not we can create time illusions if we have an organ specifically designed for time perception. Hopefully, it will be finished uh, in the next few months and I'll start experimenting with this new sense. And one of the youngest uh, cyborgs now is Paul Lombarte. He has electrodes that allow him to share his heartbeat. He lives in Milan and if you see him around the streets, you will see that his heart uh, is uh, shared through light. So he uses this uh, system to also send his heartbeats to external lights, so he can turn on and off lights using his heartbeat. And he can also make clocks work by sending his heartbeat. So this clock is advancing to the rhythm of his heart. So the faster his heart goes, the faster the clock goes. He also decided to sell his heartbeats as a work of art. So you can buy his heartbeats through an NFT. We've both presented our NFTs together a year ago. So basically all these examples uh, are not AI. They're not artificial intelligence. They are AS. They are artificial senses. The difference is that if the antenna was AI, it would be giving me the names of colors, but I didn't want technology to give me intelligence. I didn't want technology to tell me what colors I had in front of me. I wanted technology to give me the sense of color. So the difference is that when you merge with an artificial sense, the intelligence needs to be created by your own brain. If you merge with artificial intelligence, the intelligence will be given to you by the machine. The reality that these senses create is not augmented and is not virtual reality. I like to call it revealed reality. It's technology that is simply revealing something that is in front of us, but that we can't sense, like earthquakes, like the weather, like infrareds, like ultraviolets. In 2010, I created the Cyborg Foundation with my friend Moon Rivas to help other people become cyborgs. And since then, we've been uh, basically helping people uh, create these themes uh, of organ and sense creation. And we've also been defending cyborg rights. Cyborg rights are basically five. The main one is the freedom to design ourselves. We think that all these uh, implants should be done um, at least legally. Now it's, um, if you want to have a new implant, you will struggle find a doctor willing to do these surgeries. So we think we should at least have the freedom to modify our own bodies. The second right is that these implants should be considered organs, not devices. The third one is that no one should force us from removing our implants. It has happened uh, to many of us that we've been asked to leave our jobs uh, if we want, instead, like, like in, in Manel, he was asked to remove his fins if he wanted to continue working in the company. It also happened to me 20 years ago that I was a waiter in a cafe and I was asked, well, to leave basically. That I, could, I was not allowed to be a waiter with an antenna. Um, and body, body sovereignty is the right we should all have to decide who has the right to enter our body via the internet. So it's protecting our, us from being physically hacked. Future senses that might change society in a profound way is night vision. If we all had night vision, cities would be completely dark. These lights would probably be off and we wouldn't have to spend so much energy creating artificial light. Also, if we could regulate our own temperature, we wouldn't have to use air conditionings or heaters. So basically, instead of changing our surroundings, we should be the ones changing. Instead of adapting the planet to ourselves, I think we should be the ones changing so that we adapt to the planet. So I think that if we slowly start thinking like this, it will be seen as ethical to become a cyborg. And the, the more we design ourselves, the better it will be for us and for the planet and also for other species because we won't be annoying them so much changing Earth. This is basically my introduction to cyborg art. Um, it's been 20 years now that I've been walking around the streets with an antenna 
and it's been interesting to see how society has changed and evolved and how our relationship with technology has changed. 20 years ago, people that stopped me in the street asked me if I could turn on the light because they thought it was a reading light. Uh, Afterwards, in 2005 and six, people thought it was a microphone, that I was a, it was a flexible microphone. In 2007, eight, people thought it was a hands-free telephone. 2009, people thought it was a GoPro cam, that I was filming them, and they were waving at me, thinking that I was filming them. In 2011 and 12, people thought I had something to do with Google Street View, and that I was streaming the streets. In 2013, um, also that I had something to do with Google Glass. In 2015, many children asked if it, it was some kind of selfie stick attached to my head because there were many types of selfie sticks in 2015. In 2016, people shouted Pokemon and they tried to catch me. It has completely, um, it, it's, it's always changing the social reaction, but I think we will soon uh, be facing more people merged with technology and people will just stop me and ask what organ it is or what sense it is. Um, our relationship with technology is closer uh, and getting even closer. So I think we are not far from seeing many more people merging biologically with technology. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy. So, okay, thank you, of course. So we are so simple and boring, no? <laughs> Don't you think you are very ordinary? So um, I had the pleasure to talk for three hours and ask everything to Neil before. Um, you can, you feel free to ask him what you want to Neil. I have some question if nobody there and um, yes and uh, if uh, we want we can have some question I generated with uh, the help of chat GPT because is uh, the festival of uh, science and everything is now AI but um, of course uh, we start with your uh, question so Okay. Feel free in English or yeah. in Italian. Yeah, I would go with English. Hello and uh, welcome to the Settimo. And we really enjoyed uh, this program. It, I think it is a real, uh, a real invention. And uh, my question is uh, that I am curious about um, two things. Like first thing is that can you turn it on and off? Like, I mean, <clears throat> when you sleep or when you don't want to, to like, when you just don't, know, don't want to sense the colors, can you turn it on or off? And my second question is that, like, uh, um, I, I'm just curious about this thing. Like, is this, is this microchip that you uh, explained before, is this like sending messages, uh, vocal messages, or what, what type of messages? Because the expectation that I had was, I thought maybe you 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 have a, a, like a headphones that is connected to this um, uh, to this organ. I wouldn't say the device to the, to this organ that it would uh, transform the the messages to the vocal messages that you actually hear the voices, the sounds. Um, but but after the explanation that you did, I didn't get it very well. Like. I'm just curious, is this a vocal message that you receive, actually vocal messages, or not? What is it? Ah, no, no. Well, the first question is, uh, the, the on and off, there's no on off in any of the senses. So they are designed like the other senses. We don't have switches for sight or hearing. All of our senses are always on. Yeah. You can block them, you can block your nose, you can uh, close your eyes, but it, it's you can block the antenna. You can you could have an an antenna lead as well, but there's no switch um, because they're designed so that they're constantly giving stimuli to the brain. So when I sleep, I hear color, I I smell, I have my sense of all my senses are on when I sleep as well. 
it's a function of the brain to disconnect, not of the sensory organs. So the brain learns to disconnect or to focus on specific senses. If someone is, uh, if, if I'm smelling, I'm focusing on smell, if I, or if I'm cooking, I'm focusing on smell. If someone's talking, I'm focusing on hearing. If, so the brain learns to focus. And when you sleep, you learn to disconnect uh, in a way. And what this does is it doesn't give me the sound of the names of the color. It gives me the vibration. So each color has a vibration. Red vibrates at 420 millions of millions of waves per second. So this vibration enters the antenna via fiber optic. There's fiber optic. It touches the sensor inside my head and it transforms this vibration into a physical vibration. So I, I feel the vibration of red. And when you have a vibration in the bone, it automatically becomes a sound. It's like a tuning fork. When you put a tuning fork in your head, you hear it because bone conducts sound. When you have a vibration on wood or in the bone, it becomes a sound. So it, there's no loudspeaker. It's simply a physical vibration that becomes an inner sound. Okay. But it can also be used for phone calls or for any other, other thing. You can, via the internet, uh, you can call my head and I can hear your voice in my head or you can also use it to hear music. But I'm not using it for this purpose. I'm just using it for color perception. Uh, yeah, can I, can I just uh, make another question? Uh, first of all, thank you because uh, I think it was a very clever uh, speech. And I, I'm interested uh, in the linking between sound uh, and color. So if uh, maybe in your experience there's some uh, visual artist that uh, is considered a great artist but sounds bad, and maybe if there's uh, maybe a musician that uh, sounds good or, uh, okay, I don't know if I explain myself, but uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, first of all, the relationship between color and sound is a physical transposition. So what I'm hearing is the note of the frequency of light, but into in the audible spectrum so I can hear it. And it has changed, yeah, my perception of beauty because some things might look beautiful but they don't sound very good and it happens with art it, ha it can happen with people uh, with uh, it even it, and then the opposite like things that might not look very nice like rubbish might sound very harmonic and very nice so yes it, it sometimes it clashes what you see with what you hear um, but uh, I don't know Rosco for me it sounds very interesting Miro, Juan Miro, is a painter that has very specific sounds. It, it dis, he distributes sounds in a very specific way. The four seasons of Vivaldi, if you transpose them to color, it's strange, but the summer is very yellow. Uh, it, it corresponds to what traditionally people relate to each season, like uh, winter has blue, a lot of blue. Uh, so there's a, I don't know if a coincidence or Vivaldi was actually very I don't know, but uh, I've transposed the four seasons, and when I show them to people, people uh, know which one's which. And can I explain? Well, I think you did it better than me, but I'm not sure. Okay, sorry. Um, you did, I don't know, it was uh, with sound portraits. You translate in colors some of famous speech as Hitler or. Uh, it was a strange experiment, but I think it can be nice uh, to expose. Yeah, also speeches. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've transposed speeches by people that are very different. And yeah, it, it has no, no connection really. You wouldn't think like, yeah, I don't know, like Hitler. Yes. I transposed the speech by Hitler, and everything. Everyone thinks it's it looks beautiful because he just used very different frequencies. Uh, and then some peop some speeches that are very peaceful, sometimes they have the same tone, and it, it coincides of being red or viol violet, and it doesn't look so friendly. So sometimes, yeah, the it's uh, it's a different world, really. It it it, it rarely rarely corresponds to what socially we, we relate to.
licensing, you said? Licensing what? Like licensing like rights or so copyright? copyright. Ah. No one can hear her, no? There's, she has no microphone? So, no, I mean for the other people. So, oh, well. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay. I'm a little anxious about microphone, but okay. <laughs> And uh, the second question was about um, the second thought I, I have while you will explain it. Uh, because I suppose that uh, this kind of uh, invention, let's say it, um, maybe they can, of course, improve uh, people's life. Because, of course, uh, in, in your example, you can see color, for, uh, for instance. Uh, but of course, I suppose they could have uh, some military purpose. I don't know if you have any, uh, I don't know, uh, someone asked you to, to use this kind of uh, improvement for military scopes or something like that. Uh, about copyright or licensing, the, all the organs we create are open source, so they are all public and anyone can copy and recreate. So this antenna, anyone can recreate it really. Um, it's just the difficult thing is the surgery. Finding doctors willing to do the surgery, that's the most complicated aspect of the whole process. And no, the military are really trying to do the opposite. They are trying to distance themselves as possible from technology, so drones, for example, so, so that the soldier doesn't need to go to war. So I don't think they're interested in merging with technology. They're more interested in technology as a tool. Space uh, exploration is the one other ones interested in merging because if you want to go to space and you, if you have new senses, you won't have to uh, create uh, artificial spaces in space. Like, so there is more interest in with uh, NASA and SETI, SETI's Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They are the ones more interested in this area. The military, I think they're going the opposite direction is separating the soldiers from the tools or the weapons, I guess, in a sense. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, I would like to ask two questions as well. So the first one is uh, about the brain itself. After 20 years, you've been wearing this kind of antenna. If they found by RMI or some other exams that maybe something biological has changed as well. Is there something, I mean, brain is neuroplastic, so I think maybe there could be some changes in your body. And the second one is about using this kind of uh, new organs even to not just in input but in output as well. Is, do you know somebody that used this kind of new senses or uh, devices? I don't know if this is respectful or not, but it, do you know somebody that, uh, because I read something about the University of Reading where there's this guy or professor that made an implant that he used to, to move a mechanical arm in, from New York in, in London. So, uh, and I, I read something about transhumanism. I would like to know if you know somebody or something interesting to share with us about uh, output as well, you know, not just like sense, but even like, you know, uh, output something. Thank you. Yeah, I showed uh, Paul, Paul Lombarte. His, his uh, electrodes are output. Then he's not receiving, he's sending his heartbeats. So he's using these, uh, this technology as an output. Also the example I gave of uh, transcendental communication, this is output and input as well. It's sending a vibration to someone else's mouth and receiving the vibration in the mouth. But these are no longer senses, but abilities. Those talking, speaking to you is not a sense, it's an ability. Uh, so sending is no longer a sense. I focus more on sensing. Um, with outputs, there's much, much more. There's lots of um, medical devices that send your uh, blood sugar levels, your uh, things that are inside sent to the machine. There's more uh, types of thing. Also, NFTs like I, um, RF, the small implants that send information to a mobile phone or 
most of the cats and dogs you have have implants that are served as outputs as well. And the first question was... <laughs> ah, my brain, yeah. The brain, my brain was scanned in 2012, eight years after hearing color continuously, and it hasn't been scanned since. Uh, so yeah, maybe it's about time to see what, what's, <laughs> what's happening, but no. I, and the, the, the whole process was documented on Spanish national television. So there's a documentary where you see me going in this tack machine and then the, the doctors say what they, how they see the connections basically. Uh, yeah. Before next uh, questions, he said 100, no, 100 of questions you are uh, able to. Uh, this was uh, interesting for us uh, thinking about this inner and outer space because I think for me it's different to think a cyborg or a cyborg artist because I think one thing is only to be a cyborg, so have a device or a new organ, and another thing is to have a new sense evolving to something in artistic way. So um, as your painting or composition, musical composition, I think this is not only because you are a cyborg, but because you are a cyborg artist and so you have something to communicate. I think it is another uh, things to say, no? Yeah, I think one thing is cyborg as an identity and cyborg artist as a, I guess, a, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's uh, being a cyborg, I think it's just including technology as part of your identity. Anyone that feels like this, I think, is a cyborg. It doesn't. They don't. You don't necessarily need to have implants, really, to to define yourself as a cyborg. Many people that contact me, they identify as cyborgs, and that's why they want to have surgery. That's why they want to have the implants because the body is not reflecting their identity. So they feel or identify as cyborgs before they are actually merged biologically with with cybernetics. So. The word um, in the dictionary doesn't really reflect what in society I, I feel I feel it's happening. Mm. And then there's many people with implants that don't include these implants as their own identity, like people that have implants for medical reasons, and they don't feel that this is part of them, and they don't define themselves as cyborgs. Um, so. Being a cyborg is uh, n doesn't really depend on the body anymore. I think. For now. <laughs> For now. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you for your, your speech. I have a couple of questions about um, more about the transformation in the, from sound to light because we had a, um, a project in Sardinia, in the research center of Sardinia that we lead for that we carry on for several years. And one, the first question is about uh, how you, you can represent uh, the transformation of the colors because the, the, the sound has a lot of parameters, for example, the pitch, the tones, that the red is not all, always the same or green is not always the same. And so, uh, the first question is, uh, how did you find uh, the difference between uh, the specific colors, the first one? The second uh, is uh, that we in, in this project, we were looking for the, the research of the a sort of algorithm of wellness. So the, the, it, there was a lot of uh, trials to, during the year from Isaac Newton and from that, uh, that age to find a relationship between sound and colors. But uh, I think that could be interesting uh, to find uh, the, a sort of a, a relationship about to, uh, in some way, to give uh, some benefit to the people in this kind of relationship between two, these two elements. And I would like to know your opinion about this uh, matter. Yeah, when I started the design of the antenna, I, 
I searched all the color to sound theories, and there's many, 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 before uh, Newton as well, uh, but none of them seemed to be neutral or objective enough. They all had a bit of their own opinion. It was very ambiguous why that color to that. It was subjective, basically. So I just wanted to hear the sound of the frequency of light. So it's impossible to hear the sound of the frequency of light because it's a frequency that is extremely high and it's a different type of wave. So, but the frequency of red, for example, if we could hear that frequency, it would be a microtone between F and F sharp. And so it happens with each color. So uh, these are the colors, the sound of the colors that I hear are related to the actual frequency of color. The issue is that color fits within less than one octave. So there are musical notes that don't have a corresponding visual color. So that's why I created two scales, one that stretches so that each sound has a color and the other one is pure. And then there are some notes that have invisible colors like infrareds and ultraviolets. Um, I think, this, was this the... Wellness, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know much about this because, well, there are the, so I've had conversations with people that work with chakras, for example, and each sacra has a color. I'm sure, uh, yeah, we know that sounds can make parts of our body vibrate. So I'm sure color as well can make parts of our body vibrate, but I haven't gone uh, deep with this subject, but I'm sure there would be a way of, of, um, affecting the body through color and sound frequencies. Hi, Neil. I think you are a living proof of the fact that reality doesn't really exist. It's uh, subjective. So uh, what we see around us uh, doesn't really exist as we perceive it. So uh, the first question, because I have uh, uh, four questions for you, is uh, you, you talk about dreams, dreaming in colors. So did you start dreaming in colors when you started, uh, learned to perceive colors? Or uh, um, you, you think that you mm, dr could dream in colors before knowing about colors? Because colors as we perceive them doesn't exist in uh, in nature or in the real world. They are just uh, uh, the way our brain uh, show us the, the, the light frequencies. So um, do you remember if you already uh, dreamed in, uh, uh, in colors or you dreamed in black and white before knowing colors? So I always dream in black and white, but since I have the antenna, I started hearing color in my dreams, so um, that's what changed. After five months of hearing color, uh, it, these perceptions started to appear in my dreams. Uh, at the beginning, no, at the beginning, sensing color was chaotic and um, uh, it was, I had strong headaches because, uh, and I felt a bit tired every day, very tired. Uh, but after some time, the brain started to accept this uh, as being normal and then I started giving names to the sounds and then it started to become a perception and then from when it became a perception then it started to appear in my dreams so it took from chaos to information then perception something like this it, it, it came by little by little okay so um I think that this is the proof that uh, if we could add new senses, uh, our brain could use them. And uh, um, so, um, did you ever thought to uh, upgrade from uh, 
simple uh, single color sensing to a sort of image sensing? Yeah, this could be designed in different way, like it could have stereo vision or it could have an eye tracker as well, so it follows what I'm looking at. But I really like sensing color as a very general element, like smell. When you enter a room, you, you can smell the general smell and then you can get close. It's the same for me with color. When I enter a room, I sense the dominant color and then I can get closer. But this could be designed in many, many different ways could have also two antennas back. So I could have 360 degree color perceptions. You could do anything really, but I like it to be simple. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the last question is, uh, now you and uh, your other um, friends and, uh, and other artists, uh, they, they use a sensor that are passing through human senses and, uh, and then reach the brain. So in your case, uh, you feel uh, colors uh, through vibrations. Do you think that uh, in the future there could be a direct connection between sensors and the brain, so without passing through our natural senses? But all senses go through organs and they all are related to touch. Uh, you see because light touches your eye, you hear because Air touches your, uh, you can taste because chemicals touch your, everything is related to touch. To me, this is a completely new sense. It's not using any of my other senses because if I was deaf and blind, I would still sense color through this vibration inside my head. I don't have any other, it's not touch because it's, to me, touch is this. It's a vib an inner vibration that becomes an inner sound is something to me, it's a new type of stimuli, it's a new sense. In the case of Moon, having an organ that vibrates inside her feet is uncomparable with any other sensory input. And I think if we want to create sensory organs, they need to send information to the brain. It doesn't matter where, where from, but it needs to be somewhere. It can be very close to the brain or it can be very far, it will still create a new sense. It doesn't necessarily need to go directly into the brain because I don't, then you need to receive something from outside. At least that's what sensing is about. You need to receive something from outside that touches you and then it, it goes in the body and then it reaches the brain and then it creates a new path, so new connections and this creates a new type of perception. I'm, I'm not really sure about this. Uh, I think that, uh, um, yes, you, you, you are saying that the uh, visual perception or uh, touching perception uh, creates, uh, uh, you said, vibrations. Um, but um, I think that there is a sort of direct connection between the uh, nervous system from uh, our eyes or uh, our other senses to our brain. So uh, I guess if uh, uh, a new sense, new cybernetic sense could be really directly connected to the brain without uh, passing through the other parts of the body. It's like but how would you receive it? I mean, what would you sense? If it goes directly into the brain, it needs an output. Uh, like, uh, I mean, because I think that our brain could learn to, to, need, to sense... Let's imagine to, just something... Here, it needs to go to the, you need something to, con I mean, if it's a sensor, uh, it needs to be outside, no? I like it, also... It can produce, uh, uh, like the other senses, uh, uh, sort of a, a nervous signal, so like an electric signal. But then you would be using your nerves. It would still be using yes, an existing... Yes, but, but the nerve, our nerves is not a sense, is our, uh, our infrastructure uh, or... Uh, our connections. Yeah, so in Moon's case, for example, it's through nerves that she receives the, the vibration in her, because there's something vibrating in her uh, feet and then the nerves send the information to the brain. It's the same concept. And then there's many other senses that we have, because people say we have five senses. We have many more senses, the sense of balance, thermoception. We feel if something is, if it's cold or hot, uh, the sense of humor as well. 
There's many sensors also that don't have organs, specific organs. No? The last question, I'm sorry, but we have to, okay, we can stay for hours and hours. So the last questions. Well, um, last question is a very simple question. Uh, talking about the future of a human species and we we have um, I had a lot of uh, uh, a very difficult path because uh, of the ecosystem change, uh, the climate change, etc. Uh, how do you imagine the future of humanity with uh, this kind of cyborg implant? Do you think uh, that do you, do you wish uh, that uh, humanity moved towards? Uh, this kind of uh, implementation of our senses to better um, uh, adapt to the, to, the to the new habit that we will have to, to live in? Or what are your ideas? Yeah, I think we should adapt to the planet and ways of adapting is changing ourselves. Uh, so we still haven't adapted to our own planet. We struggle to live in this planet. We have to as I said, create, uh, we have to, uh, we need uh, heaters when it's cold, we need to, ch we need artificial light, we need many things. We need to change a lot our surroundings in order to uh, survive or be happy in this planet. So instead of changing the planet, I think we'll start changing ourselves and it will become, it is becoming easier, but it will become easier when we can start 3D printing these organs with our own DNA so that they're 100% biocompatible when we can start adding new senses by genetically modifying ourselves instead of using chips. I think in, in the near future, this will be seen as extremely primitive, how we were using chips and electricity and metal to add new senses. It will be seen as uh, very primitive because uh, we will be able to add these organs genetically by m printing new organs with our own DNA and also adding the senses by making slight changes in our DNA. So this, I think, will, will in the future, we will be trans-species. There will be a diversity that now it doesn't exist, but there will be a diversity of species and a diversity of realities coexisting at the same time. So I think there will be a lot of futures in the future, not one where we are all the same, but there will be a diversity of existences in the future. So thank you, thank you Settimo and the festival to invite a pioneer of uh, technology, arts and human being. And we hope in the future to be here to hear uh, something new for, from you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nils. thank you very much. <laughs>